Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. This is really a very special episode. I'm very excited today to be here with none other than Paula Lopez Ochoa, who is a superstar celebrity about as big as we get in Santa Barbara from her years of being a television anchor um, on you know, KYT Channel 3. Uh, for those of us who used to get KCAL 9, we remember, you know, sort of seeing her there as well. And uh, I'm so lucky and honored to have her on the show today. And we're going to talk about what Paula's doing now um, and then talk a little bit about, you know, her story and how she got to this point. Paula Lopez, how are you today? I'm doing great, Josh. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, no, it's it's my pleasure. Just a little bit of background. I mean, I grew up in this community. Uh, I was born at Glita Valley Cottage, Glita Valley Hospital before it was a cottage. Uh, so I remember watching you, um, you know, as a teenager, seeing sort of you on television, and uh, it was always cool. You were you were sort of like this 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 anchor with a little bit of um, X factor, like oh that's Paul Lopez, right? And then you're on Channel Three, and it was just like you know we develop these relationships just in our mind with these people who are on television. You see them every day, and so it's just such an honor to be able to to talk to you and and, and be able to uh, have a conversation with you. And and you're a journalist, and I love talking to journalists too. So I'm really excited about it. But let's start off, Paula, with talking about what you're doing now well i'm you know lucky enough to be able to be doing a little bit of everything um i am a realtor first and foremost actually no i should say i'm a mom first and foremost <laughs> um i still have kids who are in school getting their master's degrees one's applying to law school so um i'm grateful to be able to you know be around for them because during my career i wasn't around much so um it's really nice to be able to spend time and quality time with them and um, I am involved with the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee. Mm -hmm. I am on, I co-chair the media committee and also involved with the fund development. And we produce Cosmopolitics, which we're working on right now. And I am involved with Women in Communications, which I, I was honored by them back in 2012. So it's kind of nice to be on board. I'll be um, taking over for Starshine Rochelle, her big job as the host of the Women of Achievement in um, luncheon. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing that in April. So we're working on planning that. That's coming up. And I also have a little production company that um, I produce videos, long-term videos for nonprofits, particularly nonprofits that focus on people in recovery. Wow. And I love the garden. <laughs> so and go much. to Dodgers games. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's great. I love Dodger fans, of course. Uh, um, let's talk a little bit about your work, first of all, um, that I've reported on with uh, Judge Frank Ochoa, your husband, uh, working to get Juana Flores back to Galita in the United States. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you became involved with that and why that was so important for you to be involved with? You know, it's been really fun being able to work with my husband. He's retired from the bench from Santa Barbara Superior Court, and he's doing mediation and arbitration and private judging. And he's of counsel in Bob Sanger's office. Um, but that it, it's, you know, it's been great to help him out with kind of keeping his office and business in order as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Juana Flores came to us actually through Sheriff Bill Brown. Um, he had a call from a constituent who said one of his um, employees, his wife was being deported the next weekend. And so this man, Ron Brown, reached out to Sheriff Brown, said, do you know anybody? What can we do? This person has been in our country for 30 years, owns a home, has, has raised 10 children, has 18 grandchildren, you know, is a taxpayer. Um, what can we do to stop this? And so he called Frank and Frank said, well, I don't do immigration law, but I can find somebody who, who does. And he reached out to Arnold, Arno Jaffe and Arno Jaffe's pro, um, uh, partner, Craig Rice. Mm -hmm. And this, it's pretty amazing. I, I wish I had documented it all. Um, that's my, you know, <laughs> first, first um, impulse is to document it all because this group came together to brainstorm, how do we keep this woman here? How do we stop the deportation? and buy her at least more time till we, we can figure something out. And so this group of journalists, um, other journalists, Dee McVicker, um, 
came together and we just started meeting and, you know, just brainstorming what we could do. And the first thing that we did is we went and I um, kind of put together the interview as Wanda was getting ready to be deported. And um, anyway, we, we figured out a way to, to, to halt the immediate deportation, but we knew it was pending. She has also a son who's in the Air Force serving our country and um, he was getting married. So we put off the deportation until after his big, beautiful wedding. Um, and we put it off for as long as we could. And then finally, April, um, two years ago, she self-deported at government order down to Aguas Calientes, Mexico, where she and her husband had you know, purchased a little home way back when, hadn't been there, um, didn't really know anybody, kind of had some distant relatives, but was really all alone. So she was down there and it, it was heartbreaking. You know, she had to leave her family and she was really one of these matriarchs of her family. I mean, she was the pillar of her family. She cared for everybody. She babysat the grandchildren. She cared for her husband who has diabetes. She cared for a grown son who has mental illness. Um, so taking her out of that family situation was just wrong. And so we just did everything we could. We tried, we enlisted the help of Congressman Carbajal. Um, we suggested that he write a bill maybe to give um, relief to parents of service members. And he thought that was a great idea. He was on board with that. His staff was on board with that. And that's what he did. We knew it was gonna be a hard sell though because we didn't have the right Congress or the right president. And you know, one of the things to say about Juana Flores is she had been living here. She had been reporting every year to ICE as, you know, as mandated. You know, they basically said, as long as you're not committing a crime and we know where you are and we know that you're reporting, you know, each year you're fine staying here. And she did this under, you know, different administrations, Republican and Democrat. And it wasn't until Donald Trump came along that he said, no, zero tolerance, you're you're out. So um Anyway, we scrambled and it was it was a pretty amazing effort from a lot of people who had different talents. And that was kind of the amazing thing is everybody brought a little something to the table. And um, we managed to finally, you know, once the Biden administration came in and committed to um, bringing home, you know, family members of service members we managed to get humanitarian parole, but we had tried everything. I mean, we asked for a pardon from President Trump. You know, we were just, it was almost like, I, I liken it to throwing spaghetti on the wall to seeing what was gonna stick. Um, so it was, it, it was a pretty amazing effort. And I will say that when we got word that Juana was coming home and it was within two days, she had to pack up everything and get to Tijuana within two days. Um, you know, I, I talked to my husband and he said, of all the things that I've done, this is the most rewarding thing that I've ever done in my career. So it was the most meaningful, the thing that it impacted, you know, real lives, real people to bring her home. And you were there at Oak Park covering it, or one of your reporters was there. And it was just, you just knew it was the right thing to do. Yes. It must we're have still been working tremendous... on it, by the way. What's that? We're still working on it, by the way. Right. She only had a one-year extension. Right. So we're working on a more permanent solution to get her um, legal status. And all of her family members have legal status. She, she crossed the border um, when she shouldn't have to go see her mother who was dying in Mexico. And that really kind of took her out of the running for um, legal status. Yeah, um, our immigration... Uh system obviously needs major overhaul yeah. because you know here she was in the country living a, an amazing life as a taxpayer raising children she goes back to mexico to visit a sick you know relative and she can't come back you know and you know or that's where she's flagged so must have been an amazing feeling for you and everyone who was so closely involved when she was finally here and you were able to have that big public moment and celebration it really um, was um, let's talk a little bit about your journalism career and how you got started. Uh, we know that um, you know, I love journalism. I love the profession. Uh, we've seen it gradually decline, um, you know, in terms of print, the print industry in recent years. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved and why you wanted to become a broadcast journalist? 
Well, to be perfectly honest, I didn't want to become a broadcast journalist. I wanted to become a lawyer and I was on a pre-law track at UCSB in the 1980s. And I was um, a history of public policy major with a political science minor intending to go to law school. But in my sophomore year, um, a professor, um, his name was Ron Teichman, he was a lecturer. He said, you know, my daughter works at KEYT at the local TV station and, and you should go, they're opening up internships and you should apply. Mm. And I thought, well, that's unusual. Um, but I had um, recently taken a leave of absence from school for medical reasons. And I thought, well, you know, I have some time on my hands. So I picked up the phone and called and it happened to be Giselle Fernandez, mm -hmm. who was somebody that I really admired. She was a Latina on the air and um, she picked, she took my call and she said, come on in. And it was such a, I walked into the newsroom and that was back in 1985. And there was such an energy in the newsroom, you know, typewriters, we were still on typewriters and they were clacking, the teletype machine was clacking and the scanners were going. And I just, you know, I just, it was one of those moments where I thought, I, I want to be here. I want to do this. And King Harris, who was the news director back then, he looked at me and he said, are you Lopez? And I said, yeah. And he said, come on. And he, I just followed him and we went down to the um, Sheraton back then. It was a Sheraton. And it happened to be that the White House press corps was in residence because President Reagan was um, at the Western White House. So I walk in and hear all these, you know, journalists that I admired, te television reporters that I admired, network, you know, Leslie Stahl, um, Donald, you know, Sam Donaldson. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, is this what local news is like? <laughs> Which it's not, but um, I got a taste of it. And you know, I, I didn't, I ended up doing an internship and back then in the newsroom, it's diff much different now, you know, you did everything. I started, you know, writing things for, for, you know, rep um, the weather report. I start, so I did everything they asked me. I, I would haul cable, I would rip wire, um, I would carry equipment and um, tag along with some of the reporters like Paul Verkamen and Larry Good and, you know, Lance Orozco and people who I still admire today for their journalism. And I learned from it's like them. a dream team era. You it know, was those names. Yeah. It, yeah, it really was. And I learned from them. Um, I learned on the job um, journalism. And um, by the time I was in my junior year, I was reporting on the weekends. I was doing the Good Morning American Cut-ins, Good Morning America Cut-ins in front of the camera. And then I would, you know, get off the air and I'd be in my class at UCSB by nine o'clock. Um, so by the time I was actually in my senior year, I um, the anchor Kim Minsley had left and they asked me to step in. And so I started anchoring the 6 p.m. and the 11 p.m. news while I was a senior in college. Mm -hmm. um, so by then, um, I, Giselle Fernandez had moved on. She moved on to KTLA in LA and then she moved on to the network, but she didn't forget about me. And she told her agent about me, Kenny Lindner, who was with William Morris, and he called me and he said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I want to go to law school still. <laughs> and he said, well, if you could move ahead in TV news, where would you go? And I said, well, I've always wanted to live in Santa Barbara. So I don't know that I would leave, but if I went anywhere, I'd probably go as far as San Diego or LA, which was pretty naive at the time to, to make a jump from Santa Barbara to LA market 117 to market two. And he said, well, if I can do that, will you do it? And I said, sure. And at that time, Disney Company had purchased KHJ in Los Angeles, and they were hiring. They were going from a staff of 30 to a staff of 300. So I got an interview, and they hired me to do the 6 a.m., uh, anchor the 6 a.m. news and the 12 p.m. news, noon news at noon. Wow. So I, I took it. And um, my mother always said, well, what happened to law school? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And no. so I moved on to KCAL. Yeah, it just question, you know, you have a really great broadcast voice. I think that's one of, I don't know if your teachers or, you know, people in the industry have told you that, but it's very striking and, and you know, it's crisp. It kind of pierces you when you talk. Um, did you, was it natural for you or did you have any issues like, oh my goodness, cameras, people are looking at me. I have to talk. I can't mess up. Like, 
what was that transition when you're doing something else in college and then you're kind of just trying this out? You know, I, I did a lot of singing. Um, I did, uh, I did musical theater. I, uh, I, I am a singer and I used to narrate plays and, you know, I, at Girls Inc, the first time I got in front of an audience was at Girls Inc narrating something. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, I never had any, you know, like speaking training, but I had a lot of vocal training in terms of singing. So I think that that helps. I think breath control helps. Um, so that, you know, I, I didn't really have any formal training in, in any of that. So, yeah, I guess just kind of blessed that way. Right. The irony, though, I will tell you, Josh, is that and, and, and my family members will tell you is that I grew up so shy. Um, there aren't a lot of pictures of me growing up. I didn't like to take pictures. So uh, it's the ultimate irony that I ended up in front of the camera. And I think the only reason I did, to be honest, is that I loved news and I love that energy that I talked about so much that yeah. that superseded any of my shyness about being on the air. Wow. So you stopped when you were, you were you hired at KCAL or you went to KCAL. So you, you were in Santa Barbara for a while and you, you know, you're doing a great job there. And then you go to LA. Okay. What was it like? You said, we, what was the time slot at KCAL? And what, what was that like for you in terms of being in that big city? Yeah, well, it was hard. I, <laughs> when, I, when I moved, it was 1990. And as I said, we were kind of the freshman class when KCAL took, Disney took over and KCAL took over. And, you know, they created this three-hour primetime news block. I wasn't in that. I did the morning news. But um then we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. We had a big reunion in LA last year, but it was shocking because when I moved from Santa Barbara, I was working with journalists who were working in Chicago and New York, you know, Pat Harvey, who's still there, moved, was working at WGN in Chicago. Yeah. And, you know, all of my news idols were working in LA and I'm kind of, I felt like, to be honest, country mouse goes to the city because KEYT was still working on typewriters. We had just gotten our first live van. And here I'm working at KCAL where they have, you know, a whole fleet of live vans, a whole fleet of satellite trucks, helicopters, we're all on computer. So it was kind of a, a shocking transition for me. Um, but luckily I worked with a team that was amazing. You know, we were all new there. We were all the freshman class and we knew that we were going to embark on something that was unprecedented in LA. Um, and the nice thing about being on in the daytime on the non prime time is that KHJ programming was like they aired Mighty Mouse cartoons and they aired all of these old programs. So at any chance they got to an interrupt programming for any kind of breaking news, they would do it. So I'll never forget the first time they sent me out on set and I ran out on set and I said, where's my scripts? And they said, there are no scripts. So I had to wing it. You know, yeah. I had to improvise and I had to just go with the flow. And I, and I did, and I learned so much by doing that. So I really, really got a lot of experience in covering breaking news from the set and just talking. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of those sink or swim. So I, was able to swim, fortunately, but it was a fun learning opportunity to, like I said, they would interrupt programming at a, the drop of a hat because anything was better than the programming that was there <laughs> during the day. Yeah. Uh, so then they would see, you know, we would get daily ratings and they would see whenever we would interrupt programming, even if it was for a car chase, you know, the ratings would go up. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was probably about the era when we did see a lot of coverage of high yeah. speed car chases in LA. We did, but it was also the beginning of the first, you know, desert, desert storm, you know, yeah. and so we sent, we sent correspondents over to the Middle East and we were covering Scud missile attacks, you know, during the middle of the day, we would run out to set if there was a Scud missile attack, we would cover that. And that was a huge opportunity that a lot of, you know, LA journalists, broadcasters didn't have because networks were kind of tied to, to their programming and committed to the programming, KHJ as an independent station wasn't. So, um, and it's kind of sent the precedent for, you know, one of the 
one of the things that stands out most in my mind is that we covered OJ Simpson trial from gavel to gavel. So that meant I was on set from 8.30 in the morning when court started until my shift ended at 3.30 and the evening people would take over. So I just sat on set for all of those months and months yeah. covering, the, covering the trial. And when they were back in, um, in uh, when court was in session, you know, we, we, were, we weren't on camera. But when they were back in chambers, we had to fill time on set with analysts and legal analysts and just fill time. So, you know, that went on for, as you know, a year uh, until the verdict. So that was one of, you know, the greatest experience that I had in and, LA. And you had a moment um, reading your bio uh, related to Rodney King, and you you were talking to a relative and asked if, if Rodney King was going to make a statement related to the LA riots. And I'll let you tell the story, but what, what was that about? And how did well, that, what did that mean in terms of your career? We were on the set, you know, nonstop continuously during the LA riots. And at one point we were able to interview my co-anchor, Keller, Carrie Kilbride and I were able to inter interview his aunt, uh, Glenda, whom he, who really raised him. And we said, you know, all of this violence, I said, all of this violence is being carried out in Rodney's name and your nephew's name. You know, is he willing to make a statement to say that he doesn't condone this violence carried out in his name? And she said, oh, no, 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 he doesn't have that power. He doesn't have that power to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, we'd be happy to have him on if he was wanting to make a statement. And, um, you know, she sort of declined. But the very next day is when he came out and set up that press conference where he, you know, said those words, can't we all just get along? Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't know if I planted the seed in his idea, his head or not, but um, it's something that I definitely remember saying, is he willing to make a statement to, you know, say that he does not condone this violence? Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's, that's a legendary, you know, memorable moment, you know, when yeah. you made that statement. What, what did you like most being out in the field, uh, talking to people live on scene or being in the studio where you're telling the story as an anchor? Most of my time was spent um, on set. I was able to do some outside reporting and then do some more long form projects which I really enjoy, but I didn't do much of the daily reporting because I started off as an anchor at KEYT and I was hired as a news anchor at KCAL. So I was there six years. And, um, you know, it wasn't just reading the news. You know, I you know, was a writer, I was an editor. Um, I spent most of the time editing and working with producers in terms of lineup. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, anchors have a lot to say about the editorial process. And I really, really enjoyed covering breaking news from the set. Yeah. Um, you know, we covered the Northridge earthquakes. I was actually out in the field during the Northridge earthquakes um, on the 14, where the 14 freeway had collapsed. So oh. I did live reports from there. Um, but we covered the fires and the floods, the Malibu fires continuously. Um, of course, the riots, the riot coverage. I was commuting from Carpinteria at the time and you know, driving into LA during the riots, during martial law was just the eeriest memory I have of driving down Gower Street where there are helicopters, where there's smoke everywhere and where there's snipers. I mean, I just you know, blew through stop sites, uh, stoplights on Gower to get to work because there were snipers on Gower. Um, so it was pretty memorable. So um, covering some of those big events, you know, and then when I came back to Santa Barbara, I came back because I had been commuting every day from Santa Barbara to Hollywood for six years. Uh, and I had at that time an 18 month old son, mm -hmm. and we knew we wanted to have another child. So I called Bob Smith, the owner, he had always said, if you ever want to come back, there's always a place for you here. And he made a place for me. It was a, and it worked out perfectly because I was just doing the evening news. Debbie Davison was, you know, anchoring the daytime. And so I anchored the 11 o'clock news. So I was really, really fortunate because, you know, about a, a year after I came back, I um, got pregnant with twins. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, it made it so that I could be home with them during the day, put them to bed and then, you know, go go to work in, in the evening. So my husband would take over and I, I go anchor the 11 o'clock news until I went full-time, um, I think in 2006 is when I started 
full back full time. But by then my kids were a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we covered a lot of breaking news. You know, we covered, um, as you know, um, the uh, Galita, you know, shooting ramp, the Isla Vista mm -hmm. rampage. Um, of course, all the fires, Hesusita, Gap all of those fires. So I love being on set. I love that energy. And um, I feel like my experience in Los Angeles, you know, gave me enough um, experience to be able to do that here. Right. And, you know, you, you were so well known, you know, as you developed a little bit of, um, you know, celebrity, you know, you, you people, people think they know you because they see you on television so often. And uh, you were in the big market and you came back. <clears throat> and so you were somebody who's kind of like a local household name, right? You know, you're like, oh, yeah, Paul Lopez, she's the journalist. And, and, and not everybody gets that sort of uh, recognition. Um, can you talk a little bit about going from that big market to the smaller market when you have, you have chill, you know, you have to balance like, oh, big market journalism broadcast journalism career maybe from there I can go you know to network or something you know I can go to CNN or whatever um or I'm going to go back to Santa Barbara and raise my kids and you know be a good parent and also you know hold on to my career can you talk a little bit about that juggling act and you know what were your considerations and, and why it was important for you to do it here in Santa Barbara you know, um, it, it was a hard decision because I knew once I came back to Santa Barbara, I was closing the door on any kind of, you know, advancement in terms of moving on to a, a bigger, you know, to, to network or, or um, and some of my colleagues did move on to network. Um, I worked with Josh Mankiewicz. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I worked with him. Dateline guy. Yeah. Dateline. Um, so a lot of my colleagues did move on to um, bigger jobs and I knew that I was leaving that behind. So, you know, it was a really a family decision. My husband had had the same sort of options. He was up for a federal judgeship in Los Angeles and he grew up in LA and really did not want to raise a family in LA. So we had three young kids and we made a decision that we wanted to raise our kids here in LA or here in Santa Barbara. You know, I, I, my kids are 10th generation Santa Barbarans and our roots are deep here. You know, my parents are here. Um, my mother passed away a year after I came back here. So I, I feel really grateful that I was able to spend that last year with her pretty close with her. Um, so, um, I feel it was the right decision for my family and it enabled me and, you know, and they, my kids say to me today, you know, mom, we're really, we're really appreciative that we didn't have to go to, you know, a, a, a care, a babysitter or anything like that. So I, that makes a lot of difference. That makes, that makes it worth it that I came back here. And, you know, even though it's a small market, we have big issues here. You know, we have big breaking news here. So I was still able to to cover those kinds of issues and those kinds of things. You know, like I said, the wildfires are huge here. Um, the the you know the, the shooting rampages that we've had, and we've had several. We've had more than than the Isla Vista rampage here. And being able to jump onto the set office. and yeah, and being able to jump on the set and give people life saving information. I, you know, I got so many letters from people who said. That was such a scary moment, the Isla Vista shootings. Um, and we felt better once we saw your saw you come on the air and talk about it and calm us down. And that meant a lot to me. Um, and then coming back here, um, even though it's a smaller market, it's my hometown. It's my community. You know, my ancestors go back to the founding of the Presidio. So yeah, it it was the right decision. And, you know, sometimes I, I look at my colleagues who moved on or who still are working in LA, Pat Harvey is still there. And I learned so much from her. She is just amazing. I worked with Jerry Dunphy, you know, who was an icon that I was watching growing up. I got to work with him and I got to be happy for the experience that, that I got from that and to be able to bring it here back home to Santa Barbara it really did. Ah, it's amazing. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, some of the, 
you know, what happened about what five, six years ago in terms of your um, kind of step away or exit from, from TV news is obviously very high profile. Um, you know, you've talked a lot uh, publicly or a little bit about your recovery. Um, you know, so you're on an, on air and then, you know, you, you, you had a, you know, a couple of incidents uh, with law enforcement Can, and, and, you know, it's from there, uh, you, you know, you're not doing the, the news anymore. So can you talk a little bit about um, sort of what that experience was, what happened and how you've been able to, uh, you know, to recover from that and, and, and sort of continue moving on in the way you have? Well, sure. Um, I, I like to, I, first of all, I, I want to tell you that I don't have a problem talking about it because I feel like if I had had other people who were open about what they were going through, it would have helped me a little bit more. So I, I do feel sort of an obligation to share my story. Um, in the hopes that it'll help others. And I don't want that to sound Pollyanna at all, but because it is the truth. Um, I came back here and I, and I like I, I, I mentioned, I grew up with a lot of shyness, but I look back now and it was a lot of anxiety. You know, that's another word for being shy. I, I grew up with a lot of anxiety and I had a lot of things that helped me along the way. As I said, I, music was huge in my life, singing. I play the piano, I play the flute, I um, play other instruments. And that was really, that really helped me. Um, but as I got older, the anxiety and depression got worse. And I found alcohol to be a really good, at the time, way to self-medicate. Um, and it worked, it worked and it helped until it didn't until it really grabbed hold of me. And, you know, I didn't know that that's what could happen. Um, I knew that there was some alcoholism in my family, which is genetic. Um, and I just kept saying, well, I can handle it. I can handle it. Um, so the biggest thing that happened to me was when the choice was made for me in terms of um, my termination from KEYT, that after a DUI, very public DUI, that it made the choice for me that I couldn't make. And that was, I couldn't get well while I was working. And I couldn't get well while I was working in the public eye. And people had told me that, and I didn't believe it. You know, I was this whole, no, I can do it. I can do it. Um, so I can look back now and say that that was the best thing that could have happened to me because it gave me time to work on my recovery and to get well. Um, and I'm grateful. I can look back now with gratitude for it. Was it the pressures of being a celebrity TV celebrity where people see you every day and knowing you've got to perform and everybody always expects perfection and, you know, they're going to criticize a broadcast journalist in ways they may not criticize, you know, a print journalist or an online journalist. Um, <laughs> Oh, you guys get criticism too. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. in part, in part. And, you know, and I will say that, you know, there are other people who, who love that and who don't have a problem with that. I happen to have a really thin skin. I don't take criticism well. Um, it strikes me to the core. And some of the things, yeah, were really, really hurtful. Um, and other people, I, I look now and I think, how do people deal with that kind of scrutiny? How do they recover from that? And why wasn't I able to? Um, but it's just because I'm different and I wasn't able to. Um, and so, you know, I, I think one of the best things I ever did was say, yes, I need help. You know, yes, I need help. And yes, I'm willing. I had to be willing to get well and to do what I needed to do. And let me tell you, Josh, it's an ongoing, it's a daily, daily process for me. Um, taking care of myself and doing what I need to do to stay sober is a daily process for me, is a daily exercise. Um, and what I learned about alcoholism was that it's, it's a disease and you've got to treat it just like any other disease. I'm also a diabetic and I've got to treat my diabetes every day. So I have learned to, to treat my disease every day. Um, you know, and part of my recovery, which goes back to what I'm doing now, is being of service. 
Um, it's one of the pillars of my recovery program, um, being of service. So uh, I shared with you earlier that I, when I was, when I left KUIT and when I was terminated, I thought, well, gee, finally I can retreat to public life. I don't, from public life, I don't have to be this public person. I can just go about and, you know, I can even move if I want to move and get, get away from everything. And, you know, I didn't, I stayed here. Um, I'm lucky enough that we live in a community that has a lot of resources for people who are dealing with addiction. I'm grateful for that because a lot of people don't have those resources available to them. So I was able to stay here and, and get well. Um, and I say get well, I don't say that lightly because getting well means again, treating my disease daily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for, for people who quietly, silently, you know, are maybe dealing with um, alcoholism or an addiction or, or, or something that they terrify, they don't want people to know about, um, you know, maybe they're in the public eye, maybe they're not. Um, what advice do you have as somebody who's lived through that in a, in a very public way, a very personal way, um, and, and came through it, and you're doing amazing now, you know, what advice do you have to people who may have like a sense of hopelessness in that moment? That they need to reach out for help. You know, I mean, I, you know, everything, everything in my life came pretty easily for me. Um, everything, school, you know, even getting into broadcasting, moving on to LA, that all came up so easily to me. And um, I had this attitude of I can do it, I can do it, I can handle it. And it wasn't until I was willing to ask for help that things began to change for me. So I really, I really advise people and I get a lot of people calling me because they know what I've been through and they know what is possible um, that, you know, at, that do ask me. And I said, you know, you have to be willing and you have to be willing to ask for help. And that's hard for a lot of people asking for help because that's admitting that you're weak. Um, and it's in, we say it's in surrendering that we gain strength. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you show tremendous strength to get through that because a, a lot of people might be dealing with that but they're not on television, right? They're not there for everyone to see. So everyone has an opinion on that. So um, I do have a lot of respect for you that you, you stayed here and you got through it and you continue to raise your family and you continue to work. And that's a, that's a strong way to tackle something that's very high profile. So that's very admirable. Um, well, one of the things that I have had is I have a huge family here, mm -hmm. huge um, cause we've been here for nine generations and, um, I had such a good support system. You know, I had a family who stayed by my side. Um, I also had a family that was willing to say, you know, you need to go and do what you need to do, um, whether we're here or not. And there were times when that was a possibility and I had to make a decision to go forward, move forward and get well. Um, knowing that they may not be around, you know, that their patience were, was expired, they were done. Um, and that was something that in the end really helped me. But having that huge family support system um, really helped. I realized that a lot of people, and I know a lot of people, and I've encountered a lot of people who have recovered overcoming much greater odds than I had to overcome. So, and those are really unsung private heroes who are struggling every single day to stay well. And I know many of them. Yeah. Um, let's, let's bring a full circle here and talk about what you've alluded to, which is your service, okay, your work. Um, you are doing work with women's groups. You mentioned the Women's Political Committee. Um, you're working with uh, women in communication and journalism. Obviously, we talked about Juana Flores. You're also a realtor. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important for you to have these networks and to be able to empower other, other people, other women? Um, why is this uh, sort of the path that you're going down at this point? Well, you know, I live in Santa Barbara. And one of the nice things about, you know, not being in journalism or not being on television right now is that I'm able to really get involved in things that I believe in and um, 
the work that Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee is doing in terms of, you know, promoting and making sure and helping women into public office is something that I believe strongly in. And it's really fun to be able to use my media experience and expertise in helping to make that happen. You know, we, we hold panels for women who are wanting to run for office. Uh, we hold mock news conferences for them. And it's really fun to be behind the scenes and to be able to do those kinds of things. Yeah. So I'm getting a lot of fulfillment out of doing that. Um, you know, I still get to um, moderate some panels. I recently moderated a panel with Dr. Carrie Baker on the, the Equal Rights Amendment, um, which I believe strongly in as well. And it's been a little bit liberating to be able to step beyond, you know, the constraints of objective journalism to be able to, to fight for things that I believe in. Yeah. And how did you get involved in real estate? Why, why was that something you took up? <laughs> you know, I... I actually started working on my real estate license before I left KEYT. I knew that I needed to make a transition out of out of television news. I knew I knew I needed to take make a transition um, to be out of the public eye, off camera, and I also wanted the flexibility to to make my own hours. Um, so I was I was actually working on my real estate license before I was terminated. And in fact, in one of those kind of, you know, serendipitous moments, the day I was terminated was the day I received my notice in the mail that I, um, for my test date for my real estate license. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So I was lucky enough to be able to be hired initially by Keller Williams. They took a chance on me in spite of all the media coverage, they mm -hmm. took a chance on me and I'm grateful for that. And then I recently moved over to Colwell Banker and I, I love it there. And my, my colleagues have been extremely supportive and I get a lot of fulfillment out of helping people to find homes. My husband always says I'm a matchmaker and that's what I do. I match people with their forever homes. So that's been really fun and it, you know, it helps me bring in some income, but it also frees me up to do some of the, a lot of the other things that I'm involved in. Actually, I just started on Monday. I start rehearsals for Santa Barbara Revels and I'll be in their production. That's going to be um, an early California Christmas and oh, cool. we'll be performing at the Libero Theater. Oh, nice. And I have kind of a lead role there. Oh. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. So I've been able to do a lot of things that I wasn't able to do for a long time. You know, I get a lot of fulfillment out of gardening, um, singing, um, you know, traveling. We just bought a new motor home and we love to take off and travel the Southwest and national parks. And um, yeah, so, you know, my life is full of balance right now. It's balanced. And, and for that, I'm really grateful. But Yes, I am able to give back to some of the organizations that really helped me. I was honored by Santa Barbara Women in Communications, and now I'll be emceeing their luncheon. So it's, right. I, I really do feel strongly about giving back to the organizations that helped me. And that goes back to my days at, you know, being brought up in Girls Inc. I was raised by a lot of the organizations that... Um, that are still around today. And I do feel an obligation to give back and to work for them. I mean, those are the things that make our community great, Josh. Yeah. yeah, And it's so great when you have successful people be able to give back in the community that help them. You know, it's, it's uh, a lot of people like, I'm gonna go as far wide, big, far away as I can. If you can give back to the same community organizations that helped you along the way, I think that's, that's really admirable. Do you miss the journalism at all? Yeah. I mean, do you ever turn on the news and say, oh, I want to do that? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, or do you just, are you no media or what's your approach? I'll be honest. Yes, sometimes I really do, especially when it's about breaking news. You know, I have this incentive to like, you know, run, run into the station. Um, when, when there's breaking news, when there's a wildfire. And um, so, yeah, I, I do miss it. I loved it. But I'm able to now say thank you to that portion of my life, thank it for what it gave to me, and be thankful for the next phase of life and be excited for what it's going to bring. And um, is there any, will you, would you ever return to, to television broadcasting news? Have you ruled that out or... Um somewhere some network something um uh i 
I'm a little too old for that now. <laughs> I'm 56. Uh, the youngins are taking over now, to be honest. It's more of an industry answering that question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I love it when I see older women still on the air. You know, Pat, like I said, Pat Harvey is a real idol of mine. Um, and I was able to see her at the reunion recently. And she's great. I, I, I love that. But no, it's, it's you know, it's, let me tell you this. It's not an industry that treats women well as they age. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I want to wrap up here. I don't want to wrap up, but I know I have to wrap up soon. But <laughs> can you, can you, um, before we go, maybe give some advice to young women who are going into, into journalism. Um, you know, I have students and they talk about female students, and they talk about challenges that I haven't experienced, okay, uh, as a reporter. No one tries to hug me when after they meet me. Um, no one wants to touch my hair. You know, nobody is, nobody's really been in any way kind of like too inappropriate with me, you know, on an initial encounter, an initial mm -hmm. meeting. Uh, but a lot of the young journalists, you know, they talk about this and like, how do you, how do you respond to this? How do you handle this? Or I feel as though I'm not getting the attention that I deserve for my skills. Can you talk a little bit about being a young female journalist and, you know, what tips, what advice, um, you know, maybe anything you've uh, talked about. I mean, you've already talked about how you know, there's ageism in the TV industry, right? So do you have any advice for, for young women who are looking to go into this business? Sure. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, I didn't encounter overt um, sexism. Um, but, you know, there were times when I was working on a story, you know, I was assigned to write the health stories or the maternity stories. Um, and finally, I had to say, look, I've never had a baby, but I do have a degree in political science. So I would have to point that out. And, you know, and I, my producers, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You know, so I, I did have to, to do those kinds of more um, uh, subtle. Um, I, I dealt with those kind of subtleties, but they're really not subtle. You know, they're ingrained. And unless we speak up and remind people, you know, I, you know, look, I have, a degree in college, the same as you do. Um, so please don't assign me all the health stories, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I did have to encounter that. Um, and again, there, there is, there is the ageism, um, which I think that women have to deal with a lot. I, I used to say this, you know, gray hairs on men add credibility, gray hairs on women they tell you to go get it colored, you know? Yeah. So there, there is that factor. Um, that being said, you know, when we look at, we look at older women who've, who are on the air, um, especially on the network, and we see the work that, that they do, and we judge them by the work that they do. Hopefully that'll shine through. And I do love to mentor young women who are going into journalism. When I started, there were not that many women in, there were not that women, many women of color um, on the air at the time back in the eighties. And, you know, that's changing. That's certainly changing. And I love to mentor young women. I was mentored, you know, by Giselle Fernandez. I was mentored by so many people coming up. I was fortunate that way. So I love to talk to people. I encourage them to, to talk to people who are in, in the industry, give a call to someone that you admire on the air and ask them for a few minutes of advice. And, you know, Journalists have certain egos and we love to talk about what we do. So we love to share and pass on our advice. And um, so that, I think that's really important. I think that if you're a young aspiring journalist, I always encourage people to be a good communicator, written and, and verbally. So yeah. I think that's the most important thing actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Paula Lopez Ochoa, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think that, that, I'm really excited to sort of watch this next chapter of you and what you're doing in the community. And I've been watching what you've been doing, you know, for a little while and our paths have crossed on stories that I reported on. And I met your son, Mateo, and a story that I was working on. And I think you um, have done a, a tremendous job persevering and showing vulnerability and sharing your story in hopes of inspiring others. You know, we, we all, have been through something or we have a family member or we know someone who's had to deal with um, addiction issues, whether it's alcoholism or anything else. So 
you know, I really admire somebody who doesn't um, hide from sharing um, information that's going to help others. And uh, you've done a great job with that. And uh, you've also had this tremendous journalism career. And there's, you know, there's, you're going to be, you know, around, you're going to be 90 years old and, you know, somebody's <laughs> going to come up to you and say, I saw you on the air, you know, and I think your impact has been tremendous over the decades. And so I think that's, you know, obviously that's what people are going to remember about you long, as well as what you're doing now, you know, with, um, with those various organizations. So uh, thank you for, for taking, taking time to, to be on the show. I truly appreciate it. Thank you for asking me, Josh. And thank you for what you're doing in the community as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Paula. Have a great day. You too.